Over at least 2,100 people were contacted and invited from our neighborhood. We still have about 250 or maybe 300 of these things left. I'm planning on taking maybe 100 of them myself and I go on my walks on in the mornings. I'm just going to plan on, that's going to be my walk. I'm just going to walk and hang out some of these door hangers in my neighborhood. So let me encourage you to pick up some of these. If you don't know where they are, talk to Clint Davison and he can direct you to them and you can find out where they, uh, where they are and you can uh, take those and, and pass them out. Listen, evangelism and planting seeds doesn't get any easier than hanging a, a door hanger. Also, let me encourage you, let's shoot for 100% of our congregation's attendance on Sunday morning. We probably should do that every Sunday morning, but let's make an extra effort next Sunday morning to do this very thing. Invite a friend, invite a neighbor, invite a, a relative, and please wear your name tag. That's really important so that our visitors can under, uh, know who we are and, and something, uh, things of that nature. So please wear your name uh, tags. I didn't have this slide up there, and I probably should have, and that is next weekend is our ladies' retreat. Uh, the ladies' retreat is going to be great this year. It's called uh, Buzzards and Butterflies. It makes me wonder, what in the world is that going to be about? But Heather Hahn is going to be here. She's from Humboldt, Texas, or the, uh, uh, the Lake Houston congregation down in Humboldt, Texas. And she's come up here almost every year with Kevin Hahn, who is a you know, one of our, our speakers, and she is a great lady. She loves the Word of God. She's going to be bringing some incredible lessons. And so let me encourage you ladies that if you haven't already done so, that you make plans to uh, be at that retreat. It's going to be a great one here at our building to begin on Friday evening. And then, of course, uh, with our Friends Day, we're going to have a evening side outside devotional with a campfire and s'mores and, and a, some speaking and some things like that. It's going to be a great time to be together with one another. Okay, enough commercials. So, as you know, for the last... Uh, Oh, since the beginning of summer, in our summer quarter, Larry Johnson, one of our elders, has been sharing a number of lessons on the subject of roles in the church. And as he has talked about roles in the church, he has spent about the last four weeks or so talking about the role of an elder. An elder, which also in your Bible could be called a pastor, an overseer, a bishop, a presbyter. Oles would be accurate names to describe this man who is qualified. Actually, there's about 25 qualifications or qualities of a man that serves as a shepherd of a, a congregation. As he has shared with us, he has gone from the word of God and he has talked to us about the qualifications of an elder, not only the qualifications of an elder and the quality of a man, but also the responsibility that that person uh, bears in order to shepherd or lead a congregation in a positive uh, way. Three weeks ago, our eldership placed before us three men to uh, share uh, in the load of shepherding a body of, of people and without any objections whatsoever uh, the congregation has decided that we'd like to place before you and to consider Art Clark, John Mendiola and of course Dana, Dana Patterson. All these men are quality uh, men. I've known them since I have been here uh, even a, a little bit before so and they have been incredible men and they have been asked to serve along with the six existing men Butch Amex, Larry Johnson, Dave Rich, uh, Wendell Welch, Charles White, and my, myself. And so they've been asked to, you know, join our arms with us in helping us to do this very, this very thing. And so I hope that we can rejoice in this incredible uh, time, this wonderful time as a congregation. It really is a, an exciting time for us when we have these many men who are qualified from God's word to share in this responsibility of uh, shepherding God's people forward. And they join hands with a number of men, numerous men who have shepherded our congregation over the years, incredible men, men of great honor, uh, men of integrity that have done so many wonderful things. Our congregation has been overly, overly blessed for a congregation of our size to have these kind of quality men to shepherd us in the past and now those in now and the present is incredible. Uh, Bob Roberts, I knew Bob Roberts only uh, and talked with him a few times up at camp and so forth, but for the rest of the men, Bob Hooper, Sam Shelby, Doug Hoy, Nolan Fox, Jim Welch, Shelby Kreider, Bob Spriggle, and Ken Welch, uh, these have been incredible men that I have had the privilege of serving with, either as a, a, the minister or preacher here, or even as a, one of the elders here. But these are incredible men, and they love God so much. And so we've been blessed with these individuals, and I just wanted to spend just a moment to honor them 
this morning and to just to remind you of who they are some of them are still with us bob has 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 moved on uh, bob roberts but bob hoover and sam shelby and doug hoy uh, they have passed on to to glory and so forth but these other men are still a part of our our congregation and they're wonderful men and they still uh, still add a tremendous amount of leadership uh, to our congregation in great ways and so uh, without me taking a whole much more time uh, what we're going to do this morning is we're going to spend a little bit of time uh, charging the three new elders and then we're going to spend some uh, time talking about what is our responsibility as a congregation towards these new elders and towards the, those that exist and then we're going to talk a little bit about unity of the body of believers and then we're going to install these men and so this morning we're going to talk about the elders charge and i've asked two of our elders larry johnson as well as wendell welsh to come and share with us a charge to these three men and so uh, Larry, it's all yours. In Acts chapter 20, here you have a chance to see what someone would say if they knew it was their last time to see you. And that's what happened with Paul is he knew that it was going to be his last time to see the elders at Ephesus. And he said the following, Take heed to your, therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God which he purchased with his blood. For I know this after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you. Therefore watch and remember that by this Excuse me. Now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. So the charge that Paul gave the Ephesian elders, I think, is also a good charge for our new elders today, for uh, Dana, John, and Art. I charge you to pay careful attention to yourselves and all the flock. I charge you to guard the flock from danger, from whatever might endanger it. And I charge you to guard yourself from whatever might make you a burden on the flock. I charge you to take responsibility to oversee the activity and the actions of the congregation of the Lord's Church at Linda Road that it might always glorify God. John, Dana, and Art, the scriptures are clear to us that, uh, that we are to be careful for yourselves and for all the people the Holy Spirit has given to you to oversee. The charge is to feed, to tend, to care for people. The charge is to commend to the word. And when you look at the scriptures, and it's, can, it says it better than I could ever say it. New century rendering of this says you must be like shepherds to the church of God, which he bought with the death of his own son. I know that after I leave, that is, Paul is talking to these elders that he won't see again, that some people will come like wild wolves and try to destroy the flock. So be careful. Also, some from your own group will rise up and twist the truth and lead away followers after them. So be careful. Always remember that for three years and day and night, Paul never stopped warning each of you, and Paul says he often cried for you. So Dana, John, and Art, this is serious charge from the Lord. And I know that you're ready for that challenge. As we as elders met with uh, Art and, and John and Dana, uh, we spent probably with each of them probably a, an hour and a half to almost three hours uh, talking to them about the responsibilities and the qualifications of an elder. And, and in that period of time, we talked about charges. We asked them a, a, a just a host of questions of what it means to be an elder and, and it, so that they would have a deep understanding of what it means to, to guard a flock of God's people, the importance of being able to oversee without being authoritarian, but to oversee them in a loving and kind manner. 
uh, to shepherd the flock of God. Probably the most intimate terms that I find within the scriptures would be that word shepherd because it really does talk about uh, a, a person that really does care for each and every uh, person within the flock of, of God. And to know that, you know, to be, have the word commended uh, to you is, is so important when you talk about the word of God. I remember as a, a young preacher, um, I remember an older man saying to me, you know, Richard, he said, uh, the one friend you will always have, the one that will always stand beside you is the word of God. Even though you might acquire enemies, enemy, even though you may have some difficulties with membership, always stay true to the word of God. It will be there for you in your most darkest hours. It will be your best friend. Hold close to it. And, and so I would encourage you uh, three men to, to certainly think about that. And then, of course, to remind you other six of this very thing itself. Well, you know, as Dave, I mean, as uh, Larry and Wendell have shared with you the elders' charge and so forth, uh, what an awesome task it is that they are given because they give an account for each and every one of, of your souls. But equally in, in, uh, awesome is the responsibility of a congregation to be able to uh, follow a, an eldership. And so this morning, I want to share with you some of the responsibilities that you have as sheep to the to the eldership. Let me also say this, that, you know, even though I'm speaking as a, a minister and even though I'm speaking as an elder, each elder rec recognizes that they are in submission to the rest of the elders. And so as you are in submission and in, in obedience to the eldership as it stands today, each and every elder is responsible and submissive to that eldership itself. And so no one man stands alone by himself or stands as an authority, but you have a check and balance. And that's why I believe that the, that the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul and others made sure that there was a plurality of elders so that we would hold each other accountable. So here are the congregation responsibilities to an eldership. Number one, I think we need to recognize that the position of an elder or a shepherd in a congregation is a God-ordained position. This is not something that some men came up with, you know, uh, willy-nilly or anything of that nature, but this is something that comes from God. This morning, uh, Larry shared from us Ephesians, the fourth chapter and verse 11. If you begin at verse 10, it says that when he ascended on high, he sent gifts or gave gifts, and some of the gifts that he gave to the body of believers were that of apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and, and teachers. And so he has given us these men here. And, and my point is, is that God ordained this. God decided this back in eternity that that's the way the church in its infancy would begin with apostles and prophets. But today, the church continues on in a vibrant kind of way and a healthy way by having evangelists and pastors, uh, uh, pastor teachers. And so Ephesians 4 and verse 11 lets us know that it's a God-given responsibility that is there. And then, of course, they've already mentioned Acts, the 20th chapter and verse 28, where Paul said to the church at Ephesus on the island of Miletus, be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. The church is not an eldership's um, uh, ownership. We don't own the church. We simply serve within the church, and it's really as much like an upside down uh, pyramid, if you will. In the corporate world, you have a right side up pyramid where you have leaders at the top and everyone below serves those leaders. But in the Lord's church, it's just the opposite of that. Church leaders or elders and deacons are seen as servants of the body of believers. And we become a foundation root, if you will, to serve those who are above us. I want to call your attention to the fact that it says the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. That's what the scriptures say, and I know that we're involved in the process, but we wouldn't know even how to begin looking for an, a, an, an elder or a man to serve as a shepherd if it were not for what the Holy Spirit has done. And so he has preserved for us in 1 Corinthians, the third chapter, in Titus, the first chapter, in 1 Peter, the fifth chapter, in Acts, the 20th chapter, and other places. He has preserved for us the word of God so that we could go down through those scriptures that were given to Timothy and to to Titus and that Peter gave to the general population of the church what a man is to look like as a, a leader within a congregation or as a shepherd within the congregation. So in a <clears throat> truly real way, the Holy Spirit does charge. The Holy Spirit has made us overseers that has allowed the congregation to recognize you as a person that could lead in that capacity. 
Number two, we are to appreciate and we are to know and respect the elders that have been given to us. 1 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter and verse 12. But we request you, brethren, by the uh, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord to give you instruction. And so when you talk about knowing and appreciating, let me ask you this question. How well would you say you know these uh, nine men? After they will be nine men, how well do you know uh, the six that are presently serving, how well do you know the nine that will be serving? Now, I know what it's, it's tempting to do. It's tempting to say, <clears throat> it's tempting to say, you know what, listen, uh, they have the responsibility of knowing us. And the answer to that question is, is that's, that's true. <clears throat> but listen, there are 470 plus of you, and there are nine of us. And if you were to do the math and put nine into 47 or 470, then you get an idea of all the people that this eldership is responsible for. And so, yes, we're to, to know you, and we try to get to know you, uh, but you need to know us a, as well. And so let me encourage you to get to know these six men so that you might be able to appreciate where they're coming from. Not just that they have a role or a position in the body of believers, but to know that they're men and to know that they are not perfect individuals and that they don't claim any kind of perfection and that a lot of decisions that are made within a body of believers sometimes doesn't have anything to do with book, chapter, and verse. We use that certainly as our authority and certainly as our guideline and principles, but there's many times when decisions are made based on a judgment that, is, that we feel is just best for a congregation. So learn to appreciate and to know these men, and the only way you can appreciate them really is to know them. Verse 13, and that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Live in peace with one Another, the purpose of shepherds is to keep the flock at peace as much as possible. But our responsibility is to esteem them highly and that we're to do so in love. The word love here is not an emotion necessarily. The word love here uh, is coupled with emotion, but it's also coupled with, with words of encouragement and actions that says that when we're asked to do something as a body of believers, then we are willing to submit to that and we're willing to work hard at that. And so it's more than just saying that we love you, but saying that we love you and then backing it up with our words and with our, our actions. Number four. We are to obey our leaders as those who are put in charge by the Holy Spirit. Hebrews, the 13th chapter and verse, uh, verse 17, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Might underline at this point here, those who will give an account. One day, these 19 men who have served in past and in the present, one of these days, uh, these men are going to stand before the judgment seat of God and they're going to give answer and they're going to give an account for how they shepherd the body of, of believers. There's a, you know, so there's that check that is, is there. But notice the very first part of that verse, obey your leaders. What that means is that it implies that we have trust and that we have confidence in these men to to lead us and that they're going to use the best of their abilities uh, to do that that very thing notice also that it says obey your leaders and submit to them the word submit is a word that means to rank beneath or to rank in order it's a military term if you will but it's to rank in order and so we as a a membership are charged with the responsibility of submitting to these men that the holy spirit has made overseers uh, that would be for us as elders, that we are to submit to the other elders, and that as a congregation, we are to submit uh, to the elder, elders or the shepherds of this flock because they do keep watch over your soul, because they do give an account, and so forth. Number six, let them do this with joy and not grief. Let them do this with joy and not grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. So I looked up the idea, what does it mean unprofitable for us? And I'm not sure exactly what that means, but I do know this, is that when elders are, are joyful and when elders feel like the flock is behind them and praying for them and in, 
discouraging them, then the difficult decisions are made less stressful. And to shepherd a flock of this many people becomes more of a joy than a task. So I, th I thought about writing either an article or writing a book at one time that was entitled, What Makes an Elder Cry? I could have said to this, this to you probably five years ago, four years ago, that I didn't know what that meant. But today I do. Uh, today I do. Today, you know, I understand uh, the value of this flock here. And there are many nights when I lay on my pillow as I say my evening prayers and I think about you. And I, I pray for you. And I worry for you. And I sorrow for you. And, and I'm sure I'm not the only one that does it. I'm sure that all the other men would say they do the exact same thing. And so let me encourage you to, to obey, to submit, to esteem them highly in love, and that you, you know them, and that you're able to support, encourage, and get uh, behind them as they do their task. Count them worthy of double honor. Uh, this here probably is talking about remunerating a man who both preaches and is an elder. But I think the idea of honor is the one that I want to draw your attention to because when you talk about honor, the, the word presbyter, which is a word for the word elder, the word presbyter means a hoary-headed or a gray-headed or an elderly person. But it's more than just an age word. It's a word that, that signifies that of dignity and, and honor. And so if a man has lived his life to such a degree that a congregation is able to recognize that this person has these 25 qualities or qualifications, that certainly does show a man that stands out in some real kinds of ways. And because of that, they're, they're worthy of the honor that is uh, given to them. Here's the last one. Call on them in time of need. He, James, the fifth chapter, the Lord's brother said these words, is any among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. I believe that goes beyond just a physical illness. I think it also speaks to that of uh, maybe an emotional crisis or maybe, maybe just some disagreements that you have or maybe some things that you just don't agree with the elders about. Uh, our eldership has an open-door policy that you're welcome to come and meet with us at any time, at your leisure, just let us know, and, and we will make that, that uh, happen. Here's what I do know about elders, which I know about each and every one of you, and it's this. We are not mind readers. Elders cannot read minds. They may wear a name. They may sit in a position. They may meet on a regular basis, but they are not mind readers. And so we can't serve you, and we can't encourage you or help you or meet your needs if we don't know what those are. And so, uh, please, uh, tell us what's on your heart and what's on uh, your mind. Uh, elders are not super Christians. Uh, we're not perfect men by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, but we desire to serve, to spend, and be spent for the cause of Christ and for your sakes as well. And so, uh, call on us in time of need so that we might be able to assist you and be able to, to help you. Well, um, so that's my part, and so now uh, Dave Rich, also one of our shepherds, he's going to come forward, and he is going to uh, talk to you about congregational unity and how we can work together with one another. Dave. Thank you, Richard, and thank you all for listening to us and uh, putting up with this, this process that... Certainly, we have no scriptural uh, di uh, diagram to follow, so it is one of uh, elder installation is one of those things that we have to do the very best we can regarding uh, how we think that God would have us to do that, and so this is what we have have uh, come up to uh, do today. I want to talk to you just briefly uh, about a subject that certainly we have all had lessons on. Richard is, has preached lessons on this idea of unity. And uh, as we do that, I want to begin to think about unity and what it might mean for each of us. And I want to start by us looking at a passage of scripture found in Romans chapter 15. Uh, and I would ask if you would take your Bibles. It's a, a 
several, several verse reading. And so I would ask that you would uh, turn with me and uh, let us read that together so that we might get a basis for where we're uh, going to attempt to uh, head today. So that was Romans chapter 15. I'm going to be reading uh, verses 1 through 6, and I'm reading today from the English Standard Version. Paul writes, uh, We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. As we, as we think about that, uh, idea, I wanted to sort of dissect just a bit of what um, it might mean or have us take a look at what it might mean uh, to have unity with one another. And so I looked up some of the um, definitions of unity and found uh, unity is a state of being undivided, oneness. Another definition was used to signify a oneness of sentiment, affection, or behavior such as would or should exist among the people of God. And so from those definitions, I think we can then delve into Scripture and uh, see what Scripture has to say regarding that very idea. David found, uh, David penned in the Psalms uh, this verse, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And in the New Testament, Jesus prayed that his disciples would experience unity modeled on the unity Jesus had with his Father. Uh, John uh, 17, that prayer that we uh, read, uh, Jesus' prayer, he says that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. So we can see that the very idea of unity is established by Jesus him, himself and the things that he did. Such unity, I think, verifies Jesus' God-sent mission and the Father's love for the world. Jesus' prayer... Uh, or unity was realized in the life of the earliest church. The first believers were together in one place. They shared their possessions and were of one heart and one soul. Acts 2.1, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. All who believed were together and had all things in common. So as, the, as in the Old Testament, though, Sin threatened the God-ordained unity. You remember the selfishness of Ananias and Sapphira in Acts uh, 5, uh, the prejudice of those who neglected the Greek-speaking widows, Acts chapter 6, the rigidness of those who demanded that the Gentiles become Jews before becoming disciples, Acts chapter 15. These all threatened the unity of the church. In every circumstance, however, the Holy Spirit uh, led the church in working out creative solutions that challenged the church to go beyond dissension to ministry. And we see that again in Acts chapter 6 and Acts chapter 15 as well. Paul spoke uh, repeatedly uh, of believers as one body in Christ. Romans 12.5 now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, 
and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. And, um, and then also, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we are members of one another. Also, uh, 1 Corinthians, for in the one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of the one spirit. So I think we can see from uh, many of these verses this very idea of the importance that God and Jesus put on having the congregation, uh, those who uh, come together to have unity among themselves. Uh, Paul, I think, also left us uh, with an with some examples of maintaining uh, unity within the church. And here, I believe, are just a few of those that we might take a look at. Um, for Paul, the unity of the church reflects the unity of the Godhead. One God, 1 Corinthians, one Lord, Romans, and 1 Corinthians and Ephesians, and one Spirit. Those three bring all of us together. Ephesians 4, 1 through 3, Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy, uh, worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Romans 12, 18, If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, Live peaceably with all. Romans 14, let us therefore no longer pass judgment on one another, but resolve instead never to put a stumbling block or a hindrance in the way of another. For the kingdom of God is not food and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Romans 14. And then finally, as we conclude these remarks about unity, uh, Paul gives us this verse, so then let us, all of us, pursue the things which make for peace and for the building up of one another. Would you stand as we pray? And now let us all bow humbly before the Lord and pray. Dear Lord God Almighty, God of heaven and earth, God of grace and of beauty, of love and of compassion, we know that in all eternity, your Lord have seen this day before it ever happened for us, this day in which we rejoice in this wonderful occasion. We lift our hearts to you, Lord, in praise on this day in which we will be dedicating to a new service three worthy men whose exemplary lives have recommended them to us through your Holy Spirit to be elders and leaders of this congregation. Pray, Lord, that you will bless each one today as he confirms publicly his desire and his commitment to this task and that you will bless all of us also as we confirm publicly our willingness to follow their lead. May the solemnity of this moment, Lord, be matched by the joy that rises in our hearts on this special occasion. We pray that your presence will be felt among us, manifest as uh, we uh, go through this process today. And as always, Lord, we pray for your wisdom, for, your, for discernment, uh, that we may know how to serve you and each other. We pray these things in the holy and precious name of Jesus, the Son, Jesus, the Redeemer and Savior, Jesus the Lord, and Jesus, the head of his church. Amen. Please be seated. Dave is right when he says that there is no pattern for the exercise that we're going through, but um, 
a number of years ago, in fact, quite a few years ago, as a, a gospel preacher before I was an elder, I've always respected elders and held them in high esteem. I know that they have a, a heavy task and a, and a burden, but I know there's a, a lot of joy that is involved with it. And I just feel like that when men serve, that they ought to be honored because of the things that they are, uh, are, uh, are agreeing to uh, participate in in terms of shepherding the body of Christ. It's with great joy this morning that we're now going to take these moments and appoint these three men uh, to the office of an overseer, a, a presbyter, a, a shepherd. And so if I could, if I could get all our elders and their wives, if you'd come forward and if you would take a seat uh, in the front pews, I'd appreciate that if you would do so at this moment, please. I ask the elders to bring their wives with them simply because of the fact that uh, um, no man can be a shepherd without first have a, 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 a wife that is behind him and the support that is necessary is so uh, vitally important and so uh, that's why I've asked the, the women to come forward most of these women say you know what I do not like getting up in front of people and I understand that because there's times when I don't want to get up in front of people uh, but I just believe that they ought to be honored because of the, uh, the task and because of the support that they give to their their husbands if i could also now ask if uh john and dana and art if you would come forward along with your wives as well I have a few questions that I'm going to uh, give to these men and then a, a question that I have for you as a congregation. So if I could ask uh, the, uh, uh, the three prospective elders, if you would please stand, uh, stand up for me, if you would please. Uh, if I could get uh, uh, Art and John and Dan, if you would come up right over here and stand here and, and face uh, this flock that God has given you, our will be giving you charge uh, over uh, Art. And, and John and Dana, do you accept the responsibility and the duties of being a shepherd for this congregation? Are you willing to spend to be spent by word, example, and deed to ensure that the flock here at Linder Road remains spiritually healthy, vibrant, and active, and giving glory to God to the best of your abilities and by God's help? God bless you. If you didn't hear them, they said, I will. So... Um, if I could have Michelle, if you could, Michelle, if you could stand, and, and Rhonda, and where's Vicky? And Vicky, could the three of you stand? You don't have to stand like these guys, you know. But ladies, um, I can't tell you how much uh, an elder appreciates you as a wife. I mean, I know they appreciate you as a wife right now, but in the coming days and in the coming years, they're really going to appreciate you so much because you're going to be such an added strength and help to them. I remember when Doug Hoy was serving as an elder here and his wife Judy passed away. And, and, and uh, uh, Doug, he served for a while afterwards. And, um, and eventually he stepped aside. And one of the reasons he stepped aside was he said, with Judy passing, I've lost the, the soft side of me. I've lost the sensitive side of me. She kept me balanced in that area and that's now missing in my life. And so I feel like I have to step aside. It, you ladies offer that to these men here, and they're going to need that, and they're going to lean on you for a lot of things. And so uh, these men are not only accepting this responsibility, but you have done so with them. And so God bless you, and, and thank you so much for your willingness to, to serve. You can be seated. If I could have the congregation stand, please. As a congregation, will you, will you as a flock of God to the best of your abilities and by God's help submit, encourage, love, and assist Art Clark, John Mendiola, Dana Patterson in helping this congregation to be all that it can be and giving glory to God in all that we do as a, as a congregation? Would you respond by saying we will? God bless you for that decision to do so. You have taken on a huge responsibility to support these these men as i've mentioned to you there are nine men 
Uh, they are not perfect men. Uh, they strive to be only Christians and to take on the responsibility of shepherding God's flock. And so may God bless you as you uh, agree to the things that you have just said yes to. If you would be seated, please, at this time. Uh, and you men can be seated, too. You're in. <laughs> What an exciting, what an exciting day. Butch Amix is going to come forward and he's going to lead us in prayer. And then I'll give you a short invitation and you'll have opportunity to come forward if there's something that's on your heart that you'd like to share. And so, Butch. Father, we are so thankful to you that you've allowed us this uh, opportunity. It's such an important day for our congregation, Father. Uh, such a blessing for uh, three families, three men and their wives to, uh, to step forward and uh, offer their help and their leadership and their guidance, Father, within the flock. We know that their qualifications started a long time ago when they determined, Father, that they would live for you and strive as best they could to follow your pattern. We know, Father, that this is a big step for them and their families. And we just uh, pray, Father, as a congregation, and pray to you that you would give them the measure of wisdom that they're going to need to honor you, Father, uh, as, the, as they do in this serving as an elder. We just uh, pray, Father, that uh, as they come to us within the six six men already serving father that they would come with a renewed and a uh, fresh perspective a fresh set of eyes father on your word help us never to become complacent in looking at your word and looking at what we think we know what we've been told that it says but father uh, we know that they're going to be challenged to look deep into your word and know as best they can what your word teaches we pray for their for their growth father we pray that uh, they would always strive to correct any course that needs correcting father within this flock and sometimes that that requires a great great deal of courage we pray for them father we pray that they would just help us strive within this congregation to help us all to be built up to be built up into christ we're thankful father and we can look at these men we can look at their families and we can see how how great they have served this congregation already the role that dana has played father within uh, this congregation as far as the worship side of it and him and Rhonda being so open within their home. For John and Michelle, Father, and for uh, John's desire to serve as a, as a treasure of this congregation and spent countless hours managing and working and making sure that, uh, that funds are sent properly and things are balanced properly. Thank you for him and for Michelle. I'm also reminded of, of Vicki making the... Uh, the comment uh, when we visited with him with Art that uh, Art's been preparing for this for all of his life. So thankful for that. Just bless them, Father, and bless us as a congregation as we move forward. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. When your first elders meeting starts at 3.30 this afternoon. <laughs> Back here in the sound and elders room is where you need to be. <laughs> I was thinking about when Butch was leading the prayer and he was talking about John Mendiola, he was talking about him being a treasure. At first I thought you said he was a treasure. And I thought, is it? <laughs> oh, what a great, great day. Um, so this concludes um, this portion of the service. Uh, I know that this hasn't been an exercise that would probably touch your heart in terms of, of wanting to respond, but there could be something that you've had on your heart all week or maybe in the last couple of days that you'd like prayers on, uh, prayers for, or maybe you have learned what it takes to become a Christian and you want to become one this, this afternoon, then we want to make that available to you. And we're going to do so while together we stand and sing and give you that opportunity. Mm -hmm.